Welcome to tonight's Expert Angle webinar titled Prostate Cancer Nutrition, Truth, Myths, and Question Mark. My name is Julia Stevenson and I'm the Health Promotion Specialist at Prostate Cancer Canada. I will be moderating tonight's webinar. Please note that we are recording this webinar and it will be available for listening to on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in a couple of days. We'll start with a few housekeeping items. First, the Expert Angle team will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. Please keep questions related to tonight's webinar topic. Second, questions will be answered during the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Third, all attendees are automatically placed on mute to allow for the best quality audio. If you are looking for further information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO or you can email them at support at prostatecancer.ca. And now I would like to introduce you to tonight's guest speakers, Christy Brissett and Sarah Buchanan. Christy Brissett is a media dietitian and nutrition and food communications expert. She is a clinical dietitian in the Cancer Rehabilitation and Survivorship Program, Elixir Kitchen, and the Head and Neck Survivorship Program at University Health Network, Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Christy is a spokesperson, speaker, writer, and recipe developer, and the president of 8020 Nutrition, a food and nutrition consulting company. She writes for the Huffington Post, the Globe and Mail, Canadian Living, and is regularly interviewed by CTV National News, the Canadian Press, and CBC Radio on nutrition and health. Sarah Buchanan is a registered clinical dietitian at the University Health Network, Princess Margaret Cancer Center. She is a primary dietitian for the gastrointestinal, genitourinary cancer, and gynecological cancer, and sarcoma programs at the center, providing care to both inpatients and outpatients within these programs. Sarah supports interprofessional collaboration and provides education for radiation therapy students at the Missioner Institute. Sarah has presented at the Toronto Cancer Education Conference and Medical Exposition on Nutrition post gastrectomy and more recently at the Gloria Pearl Education Symposium on Nutrition and Pancreatic Cancer. It is with great pleasure that I turn this webinar over to our presenters. Thank you, Julia, for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to everyone who is joining us tonight for our discussion. So because you can't see us, I'm Sarah, and I'm going to be starting the presentation, and then Christy is going to be taking over about halfway through. Just trying to, oh, there we go. Okay, so we're going to start, I'm just going to go through an outline to let you know what we're going to be chatting about this evening. Um, so we're going to start by discussing what a healthy diet looks like, and, and this is for someone who has prostate cancer, and we're also going to talk about how to modify and make some changes to this, this healthy diet to manage treatment-related side effects um, that someone might be experiencing while they're going through their treatment, and then we're going to get into some vitamins and minerals of interest and, and nutrients that have received a lot of attention. And then we're going to go into some hot topics. That's when Christy will take over. And then we're going to end with a discussion about what a healthy diet looks like for prostate cancer survivors um, and just some tips of what to focus on in general for cancer prevention. So the American Institute for Cancer Research, it's an organization that was created to help fund research in the area of nutrition, physical activity, and cancer prevention. So they have a website that anyone can access, and on this website they provide summaries of, of the latest research, as well as evidence-based recommendations for lowering the risk of cancer. So ACRE has some recommendations uh, for cancer prevention, and the reason we thought we would start with this slide is because these are the guidelines that we should, uh, people should be using across the board. So whether you're trying to prevent cancer, if you have cancer, or if you're a cancer survivor, this is what we want people to focus on. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on all of these points because Christy is going to touch on a lot of these things later on, uh, but just to highlight a few things and things to keep in mind because these topics will be coming up throughout the presentation. So maintaining a healthy weight, avoiding sugary foods that provide a lot of calories but not a lot of nutrients, so juices and foods, drinks and foods, limiting red meat and avoiding processed meats and then trying to embrace a more plant-based diet. So some of the treatments for prostate cancer can affect uh, how people eat and what they eat. Um, so even though we have a recommended diet, as outlined on the, last, the previous slide, it's important to make changes to the diet in order to minimize any treatment-related side effects. So we still want someone to be having an adequate diet um, and getting all of the fluid, calories, and protein they need um, so it just might be a couple of little tweaks. 
So this slide, we have a list of some common side effects. And side effects can be caused by treatment. So for example, radiation, chemotherapy, uh, sometimes surgeries. So a very common side effect is loss of appetite. And this can be related to different chemotherapies or maybe even temporarily after someone has a surgery or they've been admitted for a procedure. Stress and anxiety around a diagnosis can also, also cause a, lot, a loss of appetite and make it difficult for people to eat. Nausea and vomiting can be related to chemotherapies, uh, diarrhea the result of chemo or radiation, um, especially if there's an area of the bowel that is being affected by the field of radiation if someone's undergoing uh, radiation treatment. A very common side effect is gas and bloating, and this is actually one of the most common reasons I would be asked to see someone while they're having radiation. Uh, chemo can um, cause some taste changes, so some people report that foods don't taste the same or they taste metallic. Um, and of course, this list is not exhaustive. There could be other side effects from treatments that aren't, um, aren't on here, but if you ever need help managing side effects, you can always request to speak to a dietitian. So I'm going to focus on some specific suggestions for some of these side effects. Just keeping in mind, there's not a lot of research looking at dietary modifications for managing symptoms, specifically gas and bloating and diarrhea, which I'll discuss next, um, for the group of, of men receiving radiation for prostate cancer. So we know that gas can be caused by swallowing too much air, or consuming certain types of sugars that our bodies are not able to break down. Um, so certain vegetables and fruits, so things like the cruciferous vegetables, and some of them are listed there, the broccoli, the cauliflower, cabbage, things like that. Um, the sugar in this food, because our body can't break it down, it ends up undigested in our colon, and the healthy bacteria that live there start to ferment and break it down, um, and then the byproduct of this is, is the gas production. So removing these gas-producing foods from the diet can be helpful, um, also avoiding things like legumes, um, and even lactose-containing foods. So um, lactose, again, as we get older, sometimes people develop lactose um, intolerance, so their body's just not able to break down the lactose anymore. Or again, if someone's had some you know, irritation to their intestines because of a, a cancer treatment, their bodies just might have difficulty breaking it down. So trying a lactose-free milk. You could use a lactose-free yogurt if you wanted. Uh, some people find they're okay with regular yogurt because there's less lactose in yogurt than there would be in something like milk. Uh, some other suggestions, just avoiding carbonated beverages, um, avoiding chewing gum and sucking on candies, using straws because you're more likely to swallow extra air that way. Um, and try not to have a, or avoiding an empty stomach, because an empty stomach can cause extra gas to form, so try to be mindful and have your regular meals and snacks. So focusing on the, the diarrhea um, and some symptom management suggestions. So I usually tell people who are experiencing diarrhea that um, although making a change to your diet might not completely stop the diarrhea, obviously depending on what's causing it, um, but we can definitely be mindful of our food choices um, so we're not irritating or making symptoms worse. And I usually tell people, you know, if you're trying different diet modifications and you make a change, you remove something and it doesn't seem to provide a benefit, you know, you don't necessarily have to continue with it. And everyone is going to be different, so some food changes for one person um, might work a different way in another person. So some things to keep in mind or maybe things to um, make some changes. So damage to the digestive tract from the radiation um, may affect how the body can absorb fat. So following a lower fat diet might be helpful. So I usually suggest um, preparing meats and other types of foods in a way that avoids deep frying or using a lot of extra sauce and gravy and cream rich things. Um, being mindful of how much um, extra fat you're using. So for example, if it's like a margarine or a butter, an olive oil or other type of oil, one to two teaspoons at a time. Uh, there's also the milk products. So I already talked about the lactose. You could try some lactose-free products if you wanted. Fiber is going to be found in things like your fruits, your vegetables, grain products, um, nuts and seeds, legumes. So focusing on lower fiber um, options can be very helpful. 
keep in mind, though, that when we have diarrhea, we do lose a lot more fluid. And sometimes people think they want to drink less because they want to stop the diarrhea, but we actually need to be drinking more during this time because typically our body is reabsorbing all that fluid, and if we're having all of this diarrhea, we can become dehydrated. So it's really important to drink more. Loss of appetite is one of um, very common and one of the most important because we know that people do better when they're able to maintain their weight and nutritional status while they're going through their, their cancer treatment. So they do better while they're on their treatment. So I already mentioned some reasons why someone might experience a loss of appetite. So just some suggestions or, or things to focus on. So, <clears throat> excuse me, taking advantage of the time of day when you feel the best. For so, some people, this might be first thing in the morning. For other people, it might be later in the afternoon. Um, trying to take smaller, more frequent meals throughout the day. And try not to let the excuse of an appointment prevent you from having a meal or snack. So if you know you're going to be away from the home for a few hours, three or four hours, bring something with you. If you have friends or family who are willing to help, you know, give them a specific task. Ask them to pick up certain groceries or make a specific meal or snack. And when you feel like your appetite is poor, you want to make every mouthful count. So adding calories, adding protein if possible. If you're suffering from more than one side effect, so for example, you have loss of appetite, but you also have diarrhea, you could always ask again to speak to a dietitian for um, some suggestions in terms of balancing both of these side effects. And then the last point, so making it enjoyable. So eat with friends, eat with family. And also try not to focus too, too much on food all day long. Make sure you take some time for yourself, read a book, go for a walk, um, some relaxing activities for yourself. So shifting gears a little bit, um, another treatment, um, the hormone therapy treatment, um, carries the side effect of affecting bone health. So long-term hormone therapy, men who are taking long-term hormone therapy are at risk of bone loss, which can lead to osteoporosis. So long-term can be defined as um, six months to a year or longer. So with this group, weight gain is also common. So what they'll see is a breakdown or a loss of muscle mass and an increase in body fat. Um, so on the next slide, I'm just going to talk about some nutrition tips and things to keep in mind to try to keep your bones nice and healthy. So protein is the first one there, and we know we need protein for healthy, strong bones, rebuilding, repairing. A good way to make sure you're getting enough protein in the day is to include some with all of your meals and snacks, and there's a list or some suggestions on the slide there for you. Calcium requirements are slightly different depending on our age. So Men 19 to 70 need around 1,000 milligrams, and then over 71, around 1,200. This total, though, it includes sources from food and supplements. So if you're unable to get all of the calcium from food, you could consider a supplement. If you're going to use a supplement, choose one that's no more than 500 milligrams, because this is um, easiest or better for our bodies to absorb. And then try not to exceed 2,000 milligrams in a day. That would be the upper limit. For vitamin D, um, you'll likely see a wide range of recommendations depending on what you're reading or depending on what research is being quoted. So we have the DRIs up there on the screen for you, um, as well as the recommendations from the Canadian Cancer Society. The upper limit is for vitamin D is 4,000 international units, so not to worry if you're taking a dose above what we have on the slide. Um, just speak to your doctor or your oncologist about what the best dose is for you. Uh, salt and caffeine in the diet can have negative consequences on the bones, so <clears throat> excuse me, be mindful of how many cups of coffee you're drinking. Try not to use extra salt. Um, so if you're preparing foods or after you've prepared your meal, your meal, try not to add uh, extra salt, and then of course avoiding processed foods. Physical activity can also help uh, maintaining a healthy weight. So we have the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines. Um, so, they, so the recommendations are 150 minutes per week of aerobic exercise, so something like swimming or walking, cycling, and then including weight-bearing exercises as tolerated up to twice a week, more if tolerated. Um, but definitely get the okay from your doctor before um, starting a new exercise program or physical activity routine. So we want to make sure um, we have a healthy weight. Um, and the reason this is important is because in the short term, we want to be able to maintain our weight while we're on treatment. We know people do better. 
Uh, long term, a healthy body weight can reduce the risk of other types of cancers, chronic disease, um, cancer recurrence. recurrence. There, are diff there are different ways to figure out what a good weight is for you. Um, so you could always ask um, to speak to your doctor about this, or this is something you could bring up with your dietitian. So moving into, um, moving away from the side effect management, I'm just going to talk about some vitamins and minerals of interest. So I'm going to start with selenium and vitamin E, and you've probably heard about these before or read about them somewhere. So I'm going to talk about the SELECT trial. So the Selenium and Vitamin E Cancer preven Prevention Trial. Their goal was to determine if dietary supplements of selenium and vitamin E, either together or separately, could prevent prostate cancer. And so people were uh, put into different groups where they would either receive just vitamin E, just selenium, both, or given a placebo. So the study or the trial was done in early 2000. It was actually stopped early as they found that the supplements on their own or together did not prevent prostate cancer. The results showed that men who took vitamin E alone had an increased risk of prostate cancer. Uh, they also found that selenium taken on its own or in combination with vitamin E um, did not increase um, prostate cancer. And initially, the results had revealed when they were evaluating things initially, um, they had found that um, there was an increased number of men diagnosed with diabetes, and this was for the men only taking selenium, but then longer follow-up has since shown that there is no increased risk of diabetes. So our recommendation is not to take supplements. We want people to choose healthy foods, and if you're trying to include some vitamin E in your diet, you could include things like almonds, sunflower seeds, cooked spinach. And in terms of selenium, one Brazil nut gives you everything you need in terms of selenium for the day. Um, and you could also include things like tuna, cottage cheese. Just going to mention calcium. I know I already reviewed this in terms of bone health, but um, there's also been some research looking at calcium and risk of prostate cancer. And epidemiological studies have shown increased prostate cancer risk at high calcium intake. So this is more than 1,500 milligrams. So if you look, if you think back to the recommendations for what we need, it's 1,000, 1,200. So we want to make sure we're getting enough, just not too much. The North American um, men, North American men on average, have about 800 to just over 1,000 milligrams of dietary calcium per day. So just for reference, a cup of milk or fortified milk uh, alternative, so something like a soy beverage, would give you about 300 milligrams of calcium. Something like uh, a, port, a serving of almonds, so about a quarter cup, gives you about 95 uh, milligrams. And some spinach boiled, uh, about a half a cup would give you 145 milligrams. So again, with the, like the vitamin E and the selenium, try to choose food, or not try, do choose food, and be careful with supplements. And tomatoes and lycopene. So lycopene is a nutrient found in tomatoes, um, as well as grapefruit, guava, some other fruits and vegetables. Um, so just to summarize some of the research available, lycopene may interfere with some of the signals that promote uh, the spread of cancer cells. And these results are from cell studies. Uh, in some small clinical trials, high intakes of tomatoes as well as a higher serum, serum level of lycopene, so when they're looking and testing the blood, has been associated with risk reduction. Overall, though, we need more studies. We need larger studies and randomized controlled trials before we can recommend eating a certain amount of tomatoes or taking a certain amount of lycopene. Um, so again, like all the other suggestions I've said so far, try to get what you need from food. So include tomatoes, your grapefruit, watermelon, things like that. So I'm going to pass it on to Christy now, and she's going to talk about our hot topics in nutrition. Thanks so much, Sarah. There's lots of information online about nutrition and prostate cancer, but not all of it is evidence-based. For many people, nutrition information can be confusing. And it's no wonder, because the information out there is often conflicting and sometimes even controversial. Today we're going to touch on a few hot topics and provide the research and recommendations that you need to make healthy choices. A primary source of the confusion about nutrition and cancer is the conflicting information that's often presented by the media. 
For example, there were conflicting findings on omega-3s, fish, and fish oil recently. And although the reports oversimplified the research, these headlines caused many people to question whether or not they should be eating fish. There are also lots of different supplements, teas, and other products promising to promote prostate health. The appeal of these products is they offer a simplified approach. However, the downside, and there are many, include things like these supplements are not only unproven, they're expensive, they're unregulated, and potentially dangerous. Before we delve into some of the research and discuss what we do know about diet and prostate cancer, let's take a look at what we don't know. Because much of the research we have is observational, most of what we know is based on associations or links rather than cause and effect relationships. There's also a wide variety of studies that have different types of measurements, different study designs, and what that means is it's very challenging to combine all of the results and get a clear picture of what's happening. In many cases, we need more prospective studies or studies that are planned and then groups of people are followed over time. And that's better than retrospective studies that look back at what happened in the past. Randomized control trials, or RCTs, are the gold standard of research design. And as you could hear in Sarah's section of the presentation, we are seriously lacking in RCTs and nutrition for a number of reasons. Um, and hopefully more funding will be put towards nutrition research in the future so that we can help figure out some of these questions. One of the hottest topics in nutrition and cancer is sugar. And many people are worried that eating sugar, even from fruit, could feed cancer. So let's take a look at some of the research on sugar and cancer. Well, we know that our body cells need glucose. And if you try to deprive cancer cells of glucose or sugar, then you're also going to be depriving the healthy cells of what they need. And the cancer cells are going to take what they need anyway. It's also important to note that even if you do take all the sugars and carbohydrates out of your diet, your body is going to use protein and fat and make its own glucose. The strongest evidence that we do have linking cancer and sugar is extra sugar in your diet can provide extra calories, and this can lead to obesity. We know that obesity increases the risk of certain types of cancers and is related to a higher risk of cancer coming back. So what should we do with this information? Well, it's important to note that choosing the right type of carbohydrates and choosing foods that have natural sugars rather than added sugars is really our best bet in terms of overall nutrition and health. So we recommend that people include healthy sources of carbohydrates in their diets, like whole grains, dairy products, fruits, and vegetables, because these foods come packaged with plenty of nutrients that may help to actually fight cancer. It's best to avoid or limit foods that are high in calories but low in nutrients, and we call these empty calories. Examples would include things like candy, pastries, and pasta. Low-carb diets have been suggested as a strategy to help men with prostate cancer lose weight and perhaps starve cancer cells following the logic we talked about in the last slide about sugar and cancer. In one study done in mice, feeding mice a low-carb diet slowed prostate tumor growth. In the EPIC study, a prospective study that recruited over half a million participants in 10 European countries found that higher levels of insulin-like growth factor were associated with increased risk for prostate cancer. So while this didn't actually look at low-carb diets per se, this gave some inspiration to researchers to start looking at whether limiting carbohydrates would affect levels of insulin-like growth factor. To date, we don't have any research findings on humans and low-carb diets and prostate cancer. There is one study that's underway that's looking at the effect of a low-carb diet on weight and metabolic parameters in men with prostate cancer who are on hormonal therapy, but we don't have the results of that yet. So to summarize, we don't yet know whether low-carb diets are helpful for prostate cancer. What about for weight loss? Well, not only is the impact of low-carb diets on long-term health questionable, they don't seem to be too effective in keeping the weight off. 
In this study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, we see that low-fat and low-carb diets are less effective after four years when compared to the Mediterranean diet. And you can see that while people lost weight initially in the first two years of the study, when they were followed quite closely, as soon as people kind of went back to their own vices and were followed up less frequently, they ended up putting most of the weight back on. And the reason this is such a bad thing is not only is yo-yo dieting really hard on our mental health, but when we lose weight really quickly and then gain it back, we tend to gain back the weight in the form of fat. And it tends to build up actually around our midsection, which can increase the risk of cancer and heart disease. Now, the Mediterranean diet was really the best in terms of long-term weight loss and keeping the weight off over time. And because the Mediterranean diet is also anti-inflammatory and has heart health benefits, this makes it a great diet to follow for our overall health. Now let's take a look at the research on specific foods and prostate cancer. We hear from men that they're often afraid to include soy in their diets because it contains plant estrogens. Keep in mind, these plant estrogens are far weaker than the estrogen in our bodies and may behave differently. In cell and animal studies, plant estrogens from soy have actually been shown to block the effects of the estrogen that's in our bodies and prevent prostate cancer cells from increasing in number. To date, we don't really have clear evidence on prostate cancer risk and plant estrogens in Western populations, but in ancient countries where soy foods are eaten way more often, the rates of some hormone-related cancers are lower. Now, this is an observation, so we don't know if it's the plant estrogens in the soy that can explain this result, or maybe it's a combination of some other diet or lifestyle factors that protects against certain types of cancers. So at this time, the recommendation is to avoid really concentrated sources of soy or phytoestrogens in the form of supplements. And so what you want to do is eat soy in the form of whole foods like tofu and edamame or whole soybeans. Flax is another food that contains plant estrogens along with many other healthy nutrients. Observational research suggests that including flaxseed in the diet may reduce the risk of developing prostate cancer, and there's some research suggesting that men who already have prostate cancer might benefit from including flaxseeds in their diet. A study in over 150 men found a tumor marker improved when they added flax to their diets compared to men who didn't. Overall, more research is needed to determine the role of flaxseed and how it can help men with prostate cancer. Because it's such a healthy food and it has so many nutritional benefits, I do encourage all types of people to include it in their diets as part of an overall healthy eating pattern. We get lots of questions about dairy products and cancer. A recent meta-analysis of 32 studies suggested there may be a small increased risk of prostate cancer with high intake of total dairy products, milk, and cheese. And these high intakes were defined as about a cup and a half of milk every day. The researchers did say that there were some limitations to their analysis and that we need a lot more research to be done before having enough evidence for people to make a change to the amount of dairy products that they're having. So our recommendation is if you are having dairy products in your diet, there's no reason to stop. It's safe to continue having some dairy as part of a healthy diet. And before limiting or cutting it out of your diet, you really want to think about the nutritional benefits that it can bring. So Sarah mentioned calcium and vitamin D and their importance in bone health. And if you do choose milk alternatives instead of having dairy products, so things like almond milk, for example, you want to make sure that these are fortified with calcium and vitamin D so that you do protect your bones. Meat and cancer is such a hot topic since the World Health Organization announced that they've listed processed meat as a cancer-causing food and red meat as probably cancer-causing. The strongest link is between processed meat and colorectal cancer risk and red meat and risk of several cancers, including prostate cancer. And processed meat includes things like sausages, hot dogs, bologna, bacon, 
And an interesting finding is that the cooking method actually impacts cancer risk. So the risk of red meat and cancer goes up when you cook meat at high temperatures, so grilling or frying. Now we're not saying to not enjoy barbecue season. It's one of our favorite times of the year as well. So what you want to do is make sure if there's any burned or blackened meat, cut that part off. Don't eat that. And even try putting foil on your barbecue to lower the amount of potentially cancer-causing chemicals that form on your food. So in total, when looking at all the research we have, if you choose to eat meat, you want to limit your red meat and processed meat to once in a while, um, particularly with the processed meat, um, to keep that for special occasions. And you want to keep portion sizes to palm-sized servings for red meat. We've talked about nutrition during prostate cancer treatment. And now let's close the circle and talk about nutrition for prostate cancer survivors with a focus on after treatment. Diet patterns that prevent cancer may also help to lower the risk of the cancer coming back, to lower the risk of secondary or other types of cancer, and to prevent other diseases, things like heart disease and type 2 diabetes. So based on the evidence that we currently have, the recommendations for cancer survivors are the same as the ones for cancer prevention that Sarah presented at the very beginning of our talk. The good news with this is that there really aren't different diets for different people. So if there's someone in your family with prostate cancer or who's a prostate cancer survivor, you don't have to worry about preparing different foods for everybody um, if they're not experiencing side effects. A healthy diet for prostate cancer survivors is healthy for everyone. There's promising evidence that eating plenty of vegetables every day might be protective against prostate cancer, and for those who have it, may also affect disease progression. Results from several large studies suggest that the more servings of vegetables men eat every day, the lower the risk of prostate cancer. So we all know vegetables and fruit are good for us, but why should we eat them? What impact do they actually have from a cancer perspective? Well, we know vegetables should make up the bulk of the diet because they're rich in vitamins, minerals, fiber, but also phytochemicals, which are the immune system of plants that give them their color. And vegetables and fruits and these phytochemicals all work to prevent cancer by stimulating enzymes that help the body detoxify, reduce the genetic damage from potential cancer-causing chemicals, and may interfere with cancer cell growth and multiplication, and also lower inflammation. So if you need a, another reason to increase your vegetables and fruit, here are quite a few. The American Institute for Cancer Research recommends that to lower cancer risk and risk of cancer coming back, that we increase the ratio of plant foods on our plates. They suggest setting a goal at each meal to make one third or less of the food animal proteins and two-thirds or more foods that come from plants. So things like vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. So I challenge everybody, if you haven't had your dinner yet tonight, to try making your plate look more like the new American plate versus the typical American plate, which is usually heavier on the red meat and the refined grains with a lot less vegetables. Omega-3 fatty acids are important for potentially lowering prostate cancer risk and also for a healthy heart. They're found in oily fish like salmon, sardines, mackerel, trout, and arctic char, and also in a plant form in seeds such as flax, chia, and hemp hearts. There is more research for heart health benefits for the fish oil type of omega-3s compared to the plant version. If you're taking fish oil supplements or you want to start taking them, talk to your doctor about the amount that you should be taking because based on recommendations from the American Heart Association, the health risks increase with taking more than three grams of fish oils per day. Another hot topic is whether vegetable oils or animal fats are healthier. So the whole margarine versus butter conversation that seems to come up again and again. So what I find really interesting about this study, the health professional's follow-up study, is it really demonstrates that it's not only about what you take out of your diet, 
or reduce, but what are you replacing that food with? Is it a healthier choice or a less healthy choice? So in this study, men with non-metastatic prostate cancer were followed for about nine years. And replacing 10% of calories from refined carbohydrates, so things like white bread or pasta, and then replacing that with vegetable oil from nuts and seeds and olives, was linked to a 26% lower risk of death from all causes. So not just you know, from cancer, but heart disease and other reasons. And what was also interesting was replacing 10% of animal fat with vegetable oil was linked to an even lower risk of dying. So based on these results and, and other studies that support these findings, we recommend including healthy fats from olive oil nuts and seeds in your diet, and reducing the amount of animal fat and refined carbohydrates. So whereas during the low-fat diet craze, you might have seen people having rice cakes or having pretzels as a snack, um, we now think you'd be better off from an overall health perspective having a small handful of nuts. To summarize everything that we've talked about today, here is the best diet for prostate cancer survivors. And this is great to follow no matter what stage of your cancer journey you're at. And if you don't have any side effects, then try to keep some of these recommendations in mind. So, of course, we talked about why achieving and maintaining a healthy weight can be very helpful. Trying to go more plant-based, thinking about our healthy plate that we had from Acre having more vegetables and fruit, aiming for eight to 10 servings per day, and a rainbow of colors, and including some of those lycopene-rich foods. We also want to include high-fiber foods. This is important from a weight control perspective, and also helps lower the risk of heart disease as well as type 2 diabetes. And we want to focus on a lower-fat diet. Notice I don't say a low-fat diet, but lower fat and focusing on the right types of fat, so including some of the things like olive oil, nuts, and seeds in your diet each day. We also want to include omega-3s, and so Health Canada recommends aiming for four ounces, or about the size of a deck of cars, of oily fish at least twice a week. And then you can also enjoy walnuts, flaxseed, chia, some of these things that have the plant-based version as well. It's important to include monounsaturated fatty acids, so we mentioned our olive oil and avocado. These are important aspects of a Mediterranean diet, and we know these are heart healthy as well. And for most people, vitamin D supplements, particularly here in Canada, are appropriate. Speak to your doctor if you want to take more than the amounts that we talked about previously. So the other side of the coin, what should I be eating less of? And we did talk a bit about some of these items. So trying to cut down on the empty calories from added sugars, sugar-sweetened beverages, white flour, and other refined carbohydrates. And we're not saying, you know, never enjoy a donut or never have pasta or some of these other foods that you enjoy, but to perhaps have them less often. Red meat, processed meat, and high-fat dairy, you can also enjoy, but try to limit the amounts and have them less often to cut down on saturated fat. And avoid hard margarine and shortening. These are found in a lot of baked goods and uh, processed foods like crackers, so just check your labels. You want to try to have zero grams of trans fat. Cutting down on salt and processed foods is important for kidney and heart health. And if you're taking nutrition supplements, some vitamins, minerals, or other items, check with your doctor and, and make sure there's a reason for you to be doing so, because sometimes overdoing it, as we saw in some of the research, can do more harm than good. Um, and of course, if you do have a vitamin or mineral deficiency, or there's another reason to be taking them that your doctor has uh, requested or suggested, then of course you want to continue with that. And because we eat food, not nutrients, oftentimes it's difficult to take what we know and put it into practice. So it's all well and good to recommend a plant-based diet, but how do we make it taste good? How do we replace the red meat with beans and still really enjoy our food? So cooking skills are so important, 
and we're seeing a, a reduction in cooking skills across Canada. And so, especially for men, sorry guys, um, you don't tend to spend too much time in the kitchen as a generality, but I see, I see that changing a lot, and men are definitely eager to learn more. So there are tons of great resources out there to get you cooking some healthy and tasty meals. I'm very lucky to be part of a program here at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center called Elixir Kitchen. And you can go to elixirkitchen.ca and find some fabulous recipes incorporating the topics that we talked about today. And there's also some great YouTube videos, blog posts sharing not only nutrition information and culinary education, but also helping you build skills, simple things like even how do you hold a knife properly. Um, and these things can make a big difference in the healthiness of your meals. And we know that when people cook at home more often, they tend to follow these recommendations more easily, getting more of the fruits and vegetables and having less salt and added sugars. A few tools for you to put in your tool belt and take away from today. So we did talk a little bit about why carrying weight around your midsection is not desirable in terms of overall health risks as well as cancer risk and heart disease risk. So if you're curious to see whether your waist circumference is within a higher risk range or a healthy range, check out this YouTube video from the Heart and Stroke Foundation. And it shows you exactly how to take an accurate weight measurement and then what to do with that information. After today, if you have more nutrition questions and you don't have access to a dietitian at your cancer center, what you can do is go over to the Dietitians of Canada website, dietitians.ca, and there's a feature there called Find a Dietitian. What you can do is put in your postal code and then you can enter a keyword. So you can put in oncology or cancer, and then a list of dietitians near you who specialize in these areas will pop up and, and you can definitely speak to somebody. Um, and perhaps if you have coverage through your health insurance, then you might be able to, to see somebody that way as well. There's also a wonderful telephone service here in Ontario called Eat Right Ontario. So residents of the province can call in and speak to a registered dietitian and ask nutrition questions. There's also a great website with resources too. And I know that BC also has a service like this. And you want to check and make sure that your province offers something like this. Then you might have access to a dietitian and not even be aware of it. A few more reliable websites where you can go for more information on prostate cancer and nutrition. We talked a lot about the American Institute for Cancer Research. And there's also some other great organizations that you can check out that are listed here. Thanks so much, everybody. We hope you enjoyed our talk, and we really appreciate your attention. Thank you very much, Christy and Sarah. Before we take any questions, and just a reminder to please use the questions box to do this, we would like to do a quick poll to see how many people were participating in today's webinar. I'll just give everyone a few seconds to do this. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in that poll. And now we'll jump into questions, and we've got lots from the audience here. Um, and first, before I jump into that, I'd like to make a note that on March 8th, Jeremy Capone, who is uh, the chef at Elixir's Kitchen that, um, that Christy mentioned in her presentation, will be doing a, a, an expert angle webinar for us talking about culinary skills uh, for prostate cancer patients. So if that's of interest, uh, make a note of that in your calendar. Um, and now just jump into the questions. The first one is, could you reiterate your recommendations around multivitamins and supplements? Sure, absolutely. So multivitamins, we really think of as being, you know, covering your bases or nutrition insurance. And there's been a lot of research lately saying that multivitamins are helpful or they don't have any additional benefit. So really, the gold standard or the ideal scenario would be 
to eat a varied diet, include all the healthy foods we talked about today, and then you probably don't need a multivitamin. And with some of these nutrients that we touched on, you want to take a look at your multivitamin and make sure you're not going above the upper limit for different vitamins and minerals, because what can happen in that situation is you could be potentially overdoing it, and we've seen that there could be negative health consequences of that. So before taking any kind of supplement, I'd recommend speaking to a dietitian or talking to your oncologist or family doctor about it. Great. Thank you. Now we'll move into some questions around some specific um, foods or, or nutrients. So the first one is um, someone has heard that prostate cancer patients shouldn't consume orange juice. Do you have any information on that? I haven't heard of that one before. Is there any other information about something in the orange juice that could have a negative effect or? No, there wasn't any other extra information for that one. So I suppose we'll just continue on with your recommendations around um, balanced diet with, with covering all of those vitamins and nutrients through food. Sorry, Julia, don't mean to interrupt, interrupt you, but I was just thinking that maybe with the orange juice, because it's so high in vitamin C, that because vitamin C is an antioxidant, sometimes um, during treatment, if somebody's on radiation therapy, we will recommend that people avoid taking antioxidant supplements. Um, and so maybe at certain cancer centers, people are being advised to, to limit the orange juice because the vitamin C amount is so high and they could be overdoing it in addition to some of the other foods that they're taking in. Um, and juice, you know, it's definitely a good way to, in the case of orange juice, get some vitamin C and some nutrition. But we do recommend if you can tolerate fiber that you have the whole fruit so that you're down the absorption of the sugar. Um, the next question is, are there, is there an impact of probiotics on prostate cancer? And if so, how does that happen? Very interesting. So probiotics are a very hot topic. Um, and in terms of prostate cancer, to our knowledge, there hasn't been any research specifically looking at whether it impacts the risk or whether or not it's appropriate for cancer survivors. Uh, the general recommendation is that during treatment, you want to avoid taking probiotic capsules. It's OK to include foods like yogurt, um, but it's the capsules that are going to have really, really high amounts of probiotics. And there's some suggestion that by, when your immune system isn't at its strongest, when you're going through cancer treatment and trying to fight off the cancer, we don't want to introduce all kinds of bacteria into the diet, particularly if you're on chemotherapy, things like that. Um, we don't want to give other bacteria a chance to take over. So what we do recommend typically is that in the survivorship population or the post-treatment population, um, particularly if people have taken antibiotics for any reason, then I'll recommend at that stage that they can start taking probiotics. Um, and that's another area where I would consult a dietitian or your oncologist to make sure that you know, when you do select a dose or a strain, there's really a lot of information out there about the type and the amount that you take and the impact it will have. So you want to get specific recommendations about that. Great. Thank you. We have a couple questions around oils and fats. So the idea of olive oil versus canola oil and basil versus butter. Could you speak a little bit to that? Sure. So in terms of canola oil versus olive oil, um, so the main reason we were so olive oil-centric in this presentation is what's good for the heart tends to be good for the prostate. And so with looking at anti-inflammatory diets, um, and we didn't get into this too much in this presentation, but mono and saturated fats, so things like olive oil, avocado, tend to be neutral in terms of inflammation and are heart healthy. And then Omega-3s as well, which we talked about, also are anti-inflammatory, which is good from a cancer perspective and chronic disease perspective. 
Um, and our diets tend to be really high in omega-6 fatty acids, which are important for our health. We do need to get them from our diet, but it's this balance that makes things a bit out of whack. And having diets that are too high in omega-6s can actually increase inflammation or be inflammatory. So we want to be careful in terms of getting too much, um, you know, things like corn oil and soy oil tend to be really high in omega-6s. Um, and then what I tend to recommend to people is going for, you know, more natural foods, whole foods tends to be a better bet than going for more processed options. Um, so take a look at the ingredients that are in your food, and if there seems to be lots of chemicals or words that you don't recognize, then I would put that product back on the shelf. Great, thank you. Uh, with the recommendation for eating more fruits and veggies and fish, is there a concern around pesticides, and if so, how can a patient or survivor mitigate that? So in terms of pesticides, so proper food safety and preparing fruits and vegetables in a way to remove any residues that might have been left behind. So running under cold water for at least a minute, you don't have to use any extra scrubs or sprays to clean them. Um, that should be fine. In terms of using, or I guess trying to choose a, a fruit or vegetable that would maybe have less pesticide exposure, so there is the option of organic. Organic versus non-organic, one is not better or healthier than the other. It truly is a personal choice. Um, there are benefits, and I think um, you just kind of have to weigh out what works best. Um, each person has to weigh out what works best for them. Um, and then there was another question about fish in terms of pesticides or mercury, I think, was the question around. Would there be yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there is a resource, or there's a couple of websites where people can go and take a look at um, most sustainable fish, as well as the fish that are lowest in pesticides. So there's one called OceanWise, which I would recommend, and you can go to their website. There's also a phone app, and it will share with you the types of fish that tend to be lower, um, and that can really change over time as well. Thank you. Um, are there benefits to eating pomegranates or drinking pomegranate juice? That's a great question. I just did a Huffington Post piece on pomegranates, so it's very interesting. Um, there is some research that it might be a heart-healthy food when part of a healthy diet. So there have been studies suggesting that it might help to lower blood pressure, help to lower LDL or bad cholesterol. And pomegranates and pomegranate juice are full of antioxidants. And so we talked about, you know, the choosing fruits and vegetables with lots of bright colors. So this would definitely qualify as, as one of the bright colors. Um, and we know that the juice tends to be higher in the amount of antioxidants uh, compared to other types of juices that you might drink. Uh, but having said that, there is no one food that's going to be the be-all and end-all or the magic bullet in terms of cancer prevention or helping to fight cancer. So choose pomegranates, you know, they're in season right now and enjoy them, but try to choose a variety every single day so that you're getting the benefits of all different types of antioxidants. Thank you. For prostate cancer survivors, do you suggest or recommend any beer, wine, or other alcohol? What's the recommendation around that? So the recommendation for alcohol intake. So if someone doesn't currently drink, we don't want to recommend that they start drinking. Uh, for people that do consume alcohol, the recommendation for men is no more than two standard drinks per day, and for women it's no more than one. So again, going back to the recommendations for ACRE on cancer prevention, so if you take a look at the details they have for that as well, It'll say the same thing, you know, if you're not drinking, don't start, and if you do consume, try to limit um, to the recommendations that they have there. Thank you. We have a couple questions around spices, in particular around cumin and turmeric. Um, are there any recommendations around any benefits with those spices? That's a great question. So 
turmeric, its active ingredient that's being most researched is called curcumin. So looking at curcumin extracts, there's been a lot of research in cell and animal studies. Um, so like we talked about with a lot of these other nutrients, we don't have a randomized controlled trial where we put people on a certain amount of turmeric and then wait 10 years and see what happens uh, as of yet. What we do know is in South Asian cultures and in areas where turmeric is used often, things like curries, that there tends to be um, a lower incidence of Alzheimer's disease, so possible benefits for brain health, and also lower risk of some types of cancer. So there are you know, some potential cancer-fighting benefits of this. And I would recommend that people enjoy the spice in their cooking. It's quite delicious um, and adds a nice, beautiful yellow color to things. Um, but like with everything, you don't want to overdo it. As we start to kind of jump on the bandwagon and see turmeric supplements and curcumin supplements becoming available, again, you don't want to overdose on these things, um, but really enjoying the spice as part of a healthy diet. And really, every single spice, every herb, they all come with different nutritional benefits. So really, you know, upping the flavor in your food and, and learning more about cooking is, is really, really helpful from a taste and a health perspective. Thank you. Um, the next question is, are there any different nutrition suggestions for prostate cancer survivors who are particularly active runners or other, other folks that are doing a lot of physical activity? That's a great question. I think it's, it's fabulous to be active, to be feeling great, and we talked a lot about physical activity and why that's so helpful for so many reasons, and there's lots that we didn't touch on in terms of you know, overall health. So being active, definitely a, a wonderful mood if you're able to do so. And some of the things that might be different in someone's diet who's particularly active is you really want to start with the healthy diet that we recommended here. So that these principles really wouldn't change. Um, you might, you know, depending on the type of activity, you might need to take in more calories if you're doing a lot of running to support that activity. You might need some extra protein if you're doing some weight-bearing activity. And really, the important thing is making sure that you're fueling and then eating well after the activity to really replace any losses. So having some carbohydrate-rich foods, getting enough fluids, getting some protein in there to help repair muscle. Um, and there's some great recommendations on the Dietitians of Canada website about how you might um, not modify your diet, but enhance your diet if you're especially active. Thank you very much, Christy and Sarah. That's all the time we have for this evening. So I wanted to remind folks that you offered some great recommendations for places folks can go for more information. Um, so do go to those spots if you have further questions after the webinar this evening. I wanted to also give a big thank you to our participants for their questions and comments. As well, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the support of our sponsors, Abvia, Salas, and Jansen, who make this webinar series possible. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. with Dr. John Bell on some interesting research about virus versus cancer. As always, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in the coming days. If you are looking for further information on prostate cancer, you can connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO, that's 1-855-722-4636 or you can email them at support at prostatecancer.ca. Thank you everyone so much for attending and have a great rest of your evening.